This is the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast. Agoro Carbon Alliance is taking action on a global scale to reverse the effects of climate change by decarbonizing farming and restoring carbon to the world's soil. On this podcast, we're going to explore carbon farming from the soil to the atmosphere and how it affects everyone in between. To learn more, visit us at agorocarbonalliance.com. Welcome to another edition of the Carbon Farming Podcast. My name is Scott War, and today we're going to discover the latest game changer for Agoro Carbon Alliance, which is cover cropping with legumes. With this innovative option, farmers can now diversify their cover crops using legumes like chickpeas, peanuts, black beans, alfalfa. The practice not only improves soil health and boosts carbon capture, but it also offers farmers a chance to participate in the carbon market and receive carbon performance-based payments. Today, we're going to explore the agronomic benefits, application methods, and success stories from growers who have already embraced this sustainable farming practice. Today, we have strategic accounts manager in the Corn Belt based in Iowa, Clay Creighton, that's going to help us understand this new innovation here at Agoro Carbon Alliance. Uh, Clay, thanks for joining us. We've heard that there may be a new way for farmers to get involved, including legacy conservation growers. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with the legacy grower, um, the idea was to always try and get these growers involved that have been you know, doing the right practices for a long time. So, for example, a legacy cover cropper, say a grower in southern Minnesota, has been doing rye for 10, 15 years. But now this year, you know, he wanted to add maybe some hairy vetch or some red clover or something like that to his mix um, for the nutrient capabilities of hairy vetch, obviously, for nitrogen efficiency. Um, then that would now qualify. That too. In the past, it would not qualify because that was still considered, you know, cover crop a cover crop. But um, we pushed back on that a bit and tried to initiate, you know, legumes have a completely different composition and property, not only for um, their their soil method and improvement capabilities, but also for application rates and just how you go about them. So now it's an improved practice. So now we have an opportunity for these legacy growers to now get involved, which is huge in the Corn Belt area. Well, let's uh, define what a legume is. When I when I hear legume, you know, uh, my experience takes me to alfalfa. But there's a ton of different legumes. Can you talk about some of the the crops that would qualify? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, me being the row crop guy, you, you first hear legume and you think of the cash crop, soybean, off the bat. Yep, so it's, yep, that's yep. like, but when, when you're considering a cover crop, then I look more into, you know, the the clovers, like the red clover, the white clover, um, all sorts of beans, um, lima beans, green beans, kidney beans, um, hairy vetch, um, all sorts of different methods and applications there. I mean, turnips technically too. There's all sorts of different um, ways and variations. And each one of these legumes have different properties that can help improve um, soil quality o- overall. So it's it, it's very important for growers to look into, okay, what are you looking for in your mix? Like don't just throw it out there just to qualify for the program. You know what I mean? Like, hey, are you looking for better nitrogen uptake possibly from one of these legume additions? Or are you looking for, you know, improved um, fracturing of the sto- of the soil, so basically inherently tillage at that point too. So I'm um, really looking into which one works best for you and your operation. We've known for years, or farmers have known for years, that legumes are a great cover crop, a rotation crop, because uh, um, it, it helps with the soil health. It brings nitrogen back into the soil, so that when you rotate out. Um, those, those rotation crops actually do better. What are some of the other agronomic benefits that, that farmers have been using legumes over the, the decades? Yeah, legumes over the decades, I would say you hit on one of the main ones that, especially in my area that I see is the potential increase in the nitrogen efficiency, you know, from that rotation, you need, you know, less synthetic or less manure or something like that the following year, because you have that nitrogen uptake, you know, returning back to the soil. Um, but with that, I would say like some operational cost savings, because then, you know, you'd have fewer passes, you know, from using that cover crop for these synthetic um, needs at that point, too. So you're reducing your, you know, your pass with your booms and stuff like that, too. Um, improved crop nutrient availability. Um, I would say the fracturing of compacted soils is a pretty big one, too. You know, if there's a lot of, you know, everybody knows what compaction is, you know, a headland, try and break that up a little bit by using, you know, more natural methods. So there's all sorts of different really neat things that cover crops can do in legumes inherently to improve an operation. 
You know, I don't know whether I knew that that legumes will help fracture those compacted soils. Can you talk about that a little bit? How that works? Yeah, yeah. So with that, what I what I've seen most of with as um, like a turnip or a radish, things like that will um, basically you know bury a little bit more, like get their root system more in there. It's a little bit more of a deep rooted system, so it'll help fracture that compacted soil. They're a little bit more resilient, um, have a better root mass overall. So helps break that up, you know, then well, that increases water infiltration, nutrient uptake, and all the good stuff that these crops need and, and want. So um, that's like, that's where I said before too, where it's like, you really need to think of what you want out of this cover crop. I like don't just throw it on there to throw it on there, like do it for a reason. Um, do the, do the research behind it ahead of time. We have information on our knowledge hub about that as well too. And you can always work with one of us or our agronomist to determine what's the best mix for your operation. You know, Clay, I think it's it's always interesting talking to uh, the agoro uh, professionals because a lot of these practices are beneficial agronomically. Um, people have been farmers have been using legumes for for decades, and knowing that it helps with soil health, it helps with uh, um, the nutrients uh, returning to the soil. Um, and possibly even carbon capture, but now there's an opportunity for them to um, get a payment on this through the Agoro Carbon Alliance. Tell us a little bit uh, uh, about how this adding legumes to the mix works. Yeah, so yeah, you kind of uh, laid it on there a little bit too. Like even farmers know that this works and that there's properties that are important that are returning back to the soil. I mean, that's why farmers in my area, North Iowa and Southern Minnesota, go from corn on corn operations to corn soy you know put that legume back in there mm-hmm. so you can get some nutrient return back there too so and that's not even including the cover crop at that point too so farmers already know that k okay, legumes work but then how do we put it on a, on a more a higher scale i guess too so um i guess by by doing that you really want to look to see kind of what is the right species like i've alluded to before what are you looking for what's going to work best in my area you know with with that if i want to fracture the soil if i want some nitrogen uptake what's going to survive better here so i'd say determine the right species first and then based off that species and if you're um adding it to like a non-legume like a rye you need to figure out the rate so how many pounds what do you really want in there and that really de- depends on your location and really how many um species you have in the mix too so you don't want to overload the soil but don't under under appreciate it either um then you want to establish your application method are you going to, you know, throw these on um, aerial application? Are you going to drill them in? Are you um, going to broadcast them? Things like that. Um, what's going to work best for your operation? Are you going to try and plant green with that, you know, eventually too? So all different methods at that point. And with that, with adjoining with Agoro, you know, we can help you with a lot of these like that too. We have a full agronomy staff to have support on this to help determine the right species, determine the rate, you know, and talk to you about your different methods of ap- application. And then we're there to help address any concerns and stuff going forward as well. I think that's one of the strengths of the Agoro Carbon Alliance is their um, uh, agronomists that can reach out and help. Uh, If you answer any questions, make recommendations. I'm curious with, uh, you you mentioned the right species for your operation. What kind of species do you see the most of out there in the field? Um, A a lot around me, when people are first getting into the legumes, um, I'd say it's a lot of hairy vetch or a lot of red clover off off the bat uh, too, because a lot of people, especially recently, are looking for alternative nitrogen Mm -hmm. methods, you know, to reduce that synthetic um, uh, capability or need, I guess, for the following year. So that's what I see mostly around here. Then you have other guys that do, you know, four or five, six, 10 species, you know, different ways of that too. And they're looking at all sorts of different processes too, but they might be going for different methods too. That might not be a row crop farmer. That might be somebody wanting to put that out in the pasture as well too, you know, based on different mixes and species. So it's really dependent on the operation. And like I said, location too, um, more like Southeast Iowa, that's where I came across some of the turnip guys, like looking for more of the fractured soil, like the natural methods, because, you know, there can be hillier. So they're trying to look for that rather than trying to you know, pull their right, right. across at that point too. Can't blame them at that point too. So, but I'd say primarily for me, it's the red clover and the hairy vetch is what I see for the most part right now. You know, you also mentioned um, what kind of applications uh, they're going to be using. What What's a typical application where you're located in the Corn Belt? I'd say for the most part, if they had the capability to do so, um, it'll typically be flown on, oh. if at all possible. But it really... 
not to sound disingenuous here, but it really varies on the location and everything too. And, and what guys, some guys think you fly it on, that's not going to establish whatsoever. You know, it's just going to yeah. lay on top and then other guys like live and die by it where other guys want to make sure, you know, let's drill everything in or let's broadcast that on uh, to, and incorporate it later to make sure it's get, got good establishment. So it's really kind of grower dependent uh, based on where you're at. But um, I've seen re- really about anything at this point. Where, where do you see these practices mostly being um, implemented? Where, what geographic areas? Yeah, so th- throughout the Corn Belt, I would say, like for me, for example, in Iowa, that's, I would say it's mostly towards like the northeast, some of the mm-hmm. hillier areas, northeast and southeast, trying to figure out um, different um, on this on these smaller acres, what can we do like that with some highly erodible soils? I mean, that's another benefit of the cover crops as well, too, is reducing the erosion capabilities. Um, but then you have some other guys, too, that are they've heard the good benefits of cover crops. And most people around here will start with that rye like that, too. And that's pretty the universal one I hear for the most part, based on the zone I'm at in North Iowa, where it gets cold pretty darn quick. So they want to get something that can establish fast and that can last through the winter. Um, you know, we mentioned some of the the benefits uh, agronomically that you can uh, get from uh, using legumes in your in your rotation or cover cropping. Um have you seen anybody, any any growers out that are now starting to use legumes uh, to their their rotation and their mix based on carbon cropping practices? Yes, I'd say since this is, since we released this, I've had a couple of growers that shown to have expressed interest in adding this for the potential higher sequestration rates like that too. Because um, typically, like yes, an alum legume like rye obviously will sequester carbon, but when you get a legume out there, you get a bit more. Um, some biomass, some other properties and things of that nature that you will sequester more carbon at that point too. So, and just for the fact too of including that legacy grower, um, ever since I had a few guys I've talked to in the past and um, kind of placed them on hold because I'm like, look, we're not doing this now, but we hope to one day and, you know, gave them that phone call. And now they were pretty happy to receive that phone call <laughs> like that too, that, Hey, there's something we can do now to, to get enrolled. So um, I am seeing it like that too already. And I hope it continues like that too, especially like I said, throughout the Corn Belt, it's instrumental in this in the rural crop area to try and get more practices available to these growers to be able to use, I always call it their menu, you know, to kind of pick from for what they think they can do on their operation. If there's a legacy grower out there that is listening to this podcast episode, um, how do they how can they get involved if they if they've been doing this for, for years? If they want to get involved or see if they can potentially qualify, then um, direct them right to our website goralcarbonalliance.com. You can even do a fast quote on your own there too to calculate your potential. And then you can click on there to speak to a representative. And then based on your location where you're at, it might be me reaching out to you or it might be one of my coworkers. And then we can really talk to you about the ins and outs and you know what you're looking at, what species you're looking at, and when you want to implement it and to see if you really do qualify and if a goral carbon is the right move for you. I'm, I'm also interested in, in your, your last comment about um, growers that are switching from, uh, let's say, a rye grass to a legume in order to capture more carbon and to take more advantage of the carbon credit payments. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any success stories that you can relate to us on somebody that that has done that, or is this still too new? Uh, still relatively new right now, just based off when this got implemented. But um, I hope to have some of those soon because I know a lot of guys have been thinking about the legumes for a while. But we're kind of looking for a reason to do it, not just for the agronaut benefits, but hey, can I get into a program like ours as well, too? So I'm hoping to have some more success stories on that soon. But um, right now, I'm just happy to even be able to offer it to my farmers in my area. Right. And as a farmer, we're, we're always concerned about our return on our investment, right? Talk to us a little bit about how, how the, the payments, um, these carbon credit payments work with growers. Can you summarize that for us? Yep. Yep. I can summarize it for, yeah, for the most part, the payments are, um, you enroll with us. We actually have two different payment options. So we can, I'll keep it broad for now because you can kind of do it based on what operation you want to do. But, um, essentially you enroll with us. We help establish your baseline by helping you assess with collecting the data and we cover the soil sampling costs, um, upfront to see where you're starting at. And then we come back again at year five and sample in the same exact spot. At that point, too, and also try and do the same exact season. So if we sample in the spring, we like to sample in the spring again. So it's as similar soil conditions as possible. Um, and then that's your first essential carbon credit payment then at that year five. And then once again, we come back in year 10 and sample, and then you're paid once again on that difference. 
And that's essentially how the carbon credits work at that point. Um, there is another payment option that does offer some upfront help, but ultimately um, the two different payment options, it really um, allows us to really, you know, get a specific um, offering around what that grower is looking for. And I feel like it really helps us personalize, you know, um, what that grower is looking for. If you've already budgeted for it, maybe you want to do the option A, wait and see approach. If you're looking into you know, maybe a little bit of assistance, maybe option B is for you. So that's where I think our program really, um, really does help the grower. And it's not just the grower working for our program. It's our program working for the grower. Yeah, there's too. a lot of flexibility. And what I really like is Agoro is staffed with agronomists and 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 leadership that come from a farming background. So they really understand the pains and the the drive and the goals that that farmers have and have structured a program that can work for pretty much anybody depending on your situation. So that's really fun. If you want to learn more about this new um uh legume uh practice you can go to agorocarbonalliance.com what 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 other tips and tricks would you uh suggest clay well i would say first and foremost try try there you know because you can calculate your own potential we have our carbon calculator on there which is fantastic um, for you to see a little bit of an estimate up front and then right there on the website too you can say speak to representative and it goes It'll put you right in contact with somebody like me. You may be the unfortunate one and have me calling on you. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll do my best to get you as quick as I can. And um, yeah, I look forward to speaking with anybody that shows interest. You know, on the website also is um, uh, the Knowledge Hub, uh, where there's a bunch of resources uh, that you can um, you, you know learn more about it. And I just logged into agorancarbonalliance.com and I did see, I, I wasn't aware of that, that calculator. Um, but I logged onto the, the webpage and right there in bright yellow, you can't miss it says calculate your carbon potential. That's a great resource that can, you know, at least jump start If you have an inkling of, um, interest it can kind of jumpstart and then you can go from there and learn more information and, and then reach out to an agronomist that can, can hold your hand, answer questions and, um, and walk you through the whole process. Clay, thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad that uh, this is now an option for a lot of growers out there to use uh, legumes. Again, if you have any questions, go to agorocarbonalliance.com. You've been listening to the Agoro Carbon Farming Podcast, where we bring you knowledge on how to sustainably and profitably transform farming through carbon cropping. To learn more about how you can become a partner, visit us at agorocarbonalliance.com or follow us on our many social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn.